So you now have a sense, even if you're just looking at this one chart, of how difficult it is to pin down precisely what the gender gap is. But you know what? The University of Toronto employs exactly the sort of people who have that skill set. So this is the strange thing about Dr. Jordan Peterson. This controversy has been haunting him his whole life. When I was a student at University of Toronto, decades ago, it haunted me in my life. It was a huge controversy there. He's been at the center of this storm, and he's been commenting on the press for all these years. And it is very strange that he never took an interest in the social science process of uh, analysis to identify whether or not there was a problem, and then to mathematically determine the extent of the problem. You might have noticed that I don't particularly subscribe to this 21st century trend of speaking your truth, of speaking about life in terms of one's own truth, his truth, her truth, my truth, your truth. I'm still kind of stuck on this concept of the truth, as, as oppressive as that may seem. And, you know, a guy like Jordan Peterson, although he is somewhat of a conservative, if not uh, outright fascist political figure, um, you know, it's really strange that he actually personifies that far left-wing stereotype of having a certain kind of creative plasticity with the truth. And never has this been more true than in reference to what he has to say about um, gender equality and the so-called pay gap, which is to say the inequality between the amount of money men earn and the amount of money women earn. And not only have I seen him asked about this in general terms in interviews, but often enough, um, the question is put to him with reference to the university that he was and is a professor at for so many years, the University of Toronto. I'm now 100 years old. But when I was a young man, I also was a student at University of Toronto. And at that time already, Decades ago, there was an ongoing controversy about the pay gap between men and women. Now, when people are dishonest, it's very difficult to tell what it is they're being dishonest about and why. Jordan Peterson takes this issue of the gender pay gap, and whenever he's asked about it, or whenever he gives a lecture about it, or speaks on it, he twists the topic so that he can express his personal philosophical convictions about the so-called Big Five personality test. He twists the question so that he can give an irrelevant answer about agreeableness and his personal philosophy that the problem most women have, not all, most women and some men have, is that they are too agreeable to get paid a higher rate in a capitalist free market situation. Now, the problem with that philosophy is not whether it is right or wrong, uh, not the extent to which it's going to lead you into leading a, a bad life. The problem is that it's actually completely irrelevant to the question, which is an interesting one and a good one that should be taken seriously, of whether or not men and women actually are paid the same amount to do the same kind of work or the same amount of work or the same quality of work at the University of Toronto, Canada, which is a very large employer and is to some extent representative of these problems throughout many sectors of the economy. The University of Toronto does not have much resemblance to a gold mine. Whether or not men and women are paid the same working as miners is a different question. It's not that similar to working in the fire department. However, there are a lot of large companies, offices, uh, of course, schools and what have you, where you will encounter many of the same issues. That the issues that arose in people sincerely trying to measure the width of the wage gap, trying to establish whether or not there was unequal pay for men and women doing the same kind of work. So this is really the one and only statistic I want to confront you with. This is the list of the highest paid individuals at the University of Toronto. You'll notice that just two of them are highlighted in yellow. Take a good look. This is an institution with extreme wage inequality. And something I've discussed in this channel again and again and again 
is that economic inequality very often has nothing to do with helping the poor. All right, at the top of this chart, we have someone earning more than $1 million a year. At the bottom of this chart, we have someone earning $390,000 a year. These are all rich people. It's inequality, it's economic inequality, it's extreme economic inequality, but everyone in this picture is a wealthy person, if not extremely wealthy, right? Why are just two of the numbers highlighted in yellow? I highlighted them in yellow because those are the only two female employees in this chart. Everyone else is male. So this already is a really instructive demonstration of why it is so difficult in terms of serious social science research to establish the inequality of male and female pay scales, the benefits, salaries being paid to people, when you're in an institution where positions such as the professor of finance is a male position, the professor of marketing, the professor of economics, right? These, the most highly paid positions are dominated by men. You do not see here um, the professor of poetry, right? Somewhere much further down the list. I'm, I don't know, I doubt they're living in poverty, right? I don't see the professor of French, right? These are positions that stereotypically have female professors. And I, you know, I had many, many female professors when I was at the University of Toronto. My German professors, two of them were women and so on, you know, in many, many different subjects. I know that one of the professors of Buddhism and Buddhist philosophy is uh, female. For some reason, the professor of finance and the professor of management, the professor of economics, these people are earning much, much, much more money than the professor of poetry, the professor of French, professor of Buddhism, so on and so forth. And that question, which is tremendously meaningful and tremendously important, is not examined by Dr. Jordan Peterson. It's not examined by the third wave and fourth wave feminists of our time. That's actually an unbelievably important question. Now, I am in some ways more radical and more left-wing than Bernie Sanders, and I am in some ways more conservative than Jordan Peterson. Let's keep it all the way real. I am a mix of contradictory political impulses. But I actually think it is an injustice to pay the professor of finance and the professor of economics so much more than the professor of French and the professor of English. And I think if you break it down, it's at least possible that the person who is teaching French is doing more work, more hours of work, harder work, and maybe even more important work, you know, meeting with students face to face and helping them learn this language than the professor of finance. Like maybe if you had a fair system of bonuses, maybe at least some years, some of the time, some of the French teachers would be paid more than the professor of management. Maybe sometimes the professor of poetry. I think there is actually a real question of justice and injustice, given that fundamentally all of these jobs boil down to standing in front of a chalkboard, lecturing a room full of students, grading papers, grading essays, collecting exams, right? There's a scent, there is a fundamental equality to the type of labor here, and yet there's a profound inequality to how these people are paid that has nothing to do with gender, and yet, of course, the types of jobs, the types of careers these people choose are very gender asymmetrical, all right? And now you might think, you might think I'm a tremendously macho, testosterone-driven individual. You would be wrong. I'm someone who wants to lead a meaningful life, and I have a lot more in common with the women who choose those lower-paying paths in life, all right? There is no part of me ever that has looked at this kind of pay, pay scale and felt motivated to think, well, I got to claw my way to the top. No, I don't even know why I'm climbing this hill, but I want to be on the top of it. I'll, I'll be damned if the, uh, the vice dean of marketing and uh, business studies earns more than me. I'm, I got to do whatever it takes to be in the top 10 of these highly paid. I would never be motivated that way, right? I would be in one of those other departments asking totally different questions about how I can live a meaningful life and how I can help my students and how I can do important research and make the world a better place. You know, so I'm not motivated by money in this way, and that puts me into that stereotypically female gender role 
uh, kind of, but by the way, when I when I had a kid, I'm divorced. But you know, I was a full time stay at home dad. So just just want to put that in there. First year of my daughter's life, I was a full time stay at home dad, uh, and it was great. It was it was wonderful. I got to see my daughter take her first steps and chew her first solid food and all that stuff. Got to have all those great moments with my daughter during her during her first year of life. Would it be an exaggeration to say I heard her say her first words? She she made some made some sounds. All right, so let's turn to this question. So you now have a sense, even if you're just looking at this one chart, of how difficult it is to pin down precisely what the gender gap is. But you know what? The University of Toronto employs exactly the sort of people who have that skill set. So this is the strange thing about Dr. Jordan Peterson. This controversy has been haunting him his whole life. When I was a student at University of Toronto, Decades ago, it haunted me in my life. It was a huge controversy there. He's been at the center of this storm, and he's been commenting on the press for all these years. And it is very strange that he never took an interest in the social science process of uh, analysis to identify whether or not there was a problem, and then to mathematically determine the extent of the problem. So you don't need a background in math to understand this is. How do you proceed? You start with the union rules, for who gets paid how much, because there are very strict rules negotiated between unions and universities, who's getting what raise, from what salary, from what starting point, for doing what job. You start looking on a unit-by-unit unit basis for evidence that, say, two different professors of poetry, who've both been professors for the same number of years and had the same number of promotions and who check the same boxes on the union pay scale, is there a difference between men and women when you are as precisely as possible comparing their achievements and the type of work they do? And in an academic setting like University of Toronto, that also requires you to itemize how many books they've published, how many peer-reviewed articles they've published, sometimes even the quality of those books, right? You're gonna have to break that down because one professor of poetry is not equal to another and their pay is not equal. You say, oh, well, that's because this professor had a hit book. So then you're going to have to come with, okay, how many dollars is a hit book worth as opposed to a less successful book or a book with a great publisher? They had to break down these things as finely as possible. All right? And then calculate any inequalities between males and females, department by department, position by position, to establish if there were a gender bias and what it added up to. Ten years later, the numbers are in. 1.3%. Men were being paid 1.3% more than women when you really did the math to establish how much of the difference in pay is attributable to gender bias as opposed to all of these palpable factors. So the University of Toronto provides us with a fascinating, powerful, and insightful case study of what happens when we move past the initial sticker shock of just looking at a university and saying, wow, all the people who are making more than $400,000 are male. I'm sorry, there was one female in the list. There's one professor of accounting who's female. Everyone else making more than $400,000 is male. It's very easy to just look at that and say, oh, this is gender inequality, this is oppression, this is an injustice. Now, I am actually of the, the opinion that there is an injustice. I think there is a profound and important injustice in how education is organized. But it is not principally an injustice of men oppressing women. I would describe it, frankly, as a, a kind of aristocracy. We now live in a society where arbitrarily some people have these positions of unquestioned power, authority, and nearly unlimited finances in universities. And you may feel they're merited, but plenty of people who live within aristocratic societies felt that the privilege of the people in charge was based on merit too. I'll tell you something about these people earning 400000 500000 even a million dollars. Nobody elected them. Nobody questions them. Nobody cross-examines the merit of their publications and asks, are you really worth $400,000? Nobody evaluates the quality of the education they're delivering to students and asks, are you actually training people with useful skills that justifies your salary $400,000? There are a lot of really important questions. But when we did the social science research 
funded basically by a legal court challenge, seen through by a labor union and a dispute tribunal, and ultimately ending with a small but significant sum of money being paid to women who were proven to be paid slightly too little for the jobs they were doing at the university. The number that came up at the end of that investigation was 1.3%. The much more profound inequality of the society we live in is that imbeciles like Jordan Peterson end up in a pulpit in a position of real power and influence where they can go on for decades self-indulgently promoting their own peculiar ersatz ideology and seemingly never showing even the slightest interest in the facts, facts that someone like I was able to turn up with just a few Google searches. What is the value of an education when it's in the hands of someone like Jordan Peterson Someone who has used his position of power, frankly, to preach his peculiar doctrine about wage inequality between men and women while sitting in the eye of the storm at the University of Toronto, a place where this research was unfolding right before his very eyes with very real consequences for him and for his fellow colleagues at that same university. Dun, 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 dun.